I got this dream when I was after reading about um, uh, Roald Amundsen, the first man that reached the pole, South Pole, uh, when I was eight and a half years old. And I didn't realize that it was something strange or odd, uh, being a girl dreaming about the South Pole until I was 12 years old. Then I was on a trip to Germany with my school brass band, and I think it was eight, ten girls sitting in a room exchanging dreams. And all my, I'm from Bayern, the west of Oslo, and all my uh, friends, they were dreaming about big house, fancy car, and a handsome husband, in that order, sort of. <laughs> uh, and, and I was probably a very naive 12 year old girl, because I remember thinking, you know, how boring to dream about something would come automatically to you when you grow up. I was thinking then when I was 12 years old. So when it come to my turn, I said, well, my dream is to sleep with the soul pole. And I remember their reaction. You know, I was I stupid? That was impossible because that was a boy's dream. And uh, luckily, I thought it was something wrong with me. But luckily, I had read a book, another book at that same time, and that was the book about Marie Curie, the number eight priest lottery in, in chemistry. And she was the first woman, young woman, that attended the Sorbonne University in Paris. And she was sort of inspiring for me. Because, okay. She did that, you know, that was her first, maybe it's possible for, for a girl to, to ski for the South Pole. And um, due to, you know, life and family, and uh, I got the dream when I was eight and a half years, years old, and I was actually 41 when I am on my way, on my solo trip in 1994. Uh, I just want to change um, as the, the first sort of big learning about how, you know, what you mentally can do with yourself, because I came, uh, after a week I came into this area with high sisters, it was like skiing on the frozen ocean. And that was, I had never experienced that before, not crossing Greenland, never in the, uh, the Norwegian mountains, and I started to get irritated. And I was uh, swearing and tearing because I had a sled with everything I needed for 50 days, being 100 kilos, and I came got the top of the sastrugi, I had to run a couple of steps to, to avoid to get it into my heels. So um, I was swearing and after three days I was laying in my sleeping bag thinking and I was ex not exhausted but really tired. Not that good feeling of using your, your body but being irritated. And I'm pretty sure that you have experienced something similar. Maybe not with the sastrugis but with a um, person or a decision that you, you know, get, you know, thinking and going back and think and think and think and we can't let it go. And luckily I was thinking, uh, saying to myself, you leave, you can't go here swearing for 50, 60 days, you will be exhausted when you reach the cell phone. And then a thought came into my mind, okay, from tomorrow I will imagine that I ski in a gallery of modern art. And that changed my <laughs> expedition totally. Suddenly I saw pictures in the snow, in the sky, and my mind went all over. So when I planned my solo trip, but as a teacher, I, uh, I also taught in literature, I brought poetry. So that in combination with you know, looking at the shape of the snow and the skies, and reading a little poetry every, every night, I think I loaded my batteries for the rest of my life with that expedition. But you have to train, you have to take care of yourself, and only you know and when enough is enough. And oh, as a teacher, as a parent, we have, it's important that we challenge young people and ourselves as well, so we don't get bored. I reached the South Pole Christmas Eve in 1994, and when I came back to school, uh, my high school, I realized that my students were so excited. And I promised myself that I would, because I felt it was a privilege to have sort of a dream or a goal with your wife. And we talked in the end, and, and when I met Anne Bancroft, she's from the United States, she asked me if I wanted to cross the Antarctic continent with her. And we created a curriculum called Dare to Dream, and also a motor with a curriculum about Antarctica. And we put up the four objectives. We wanted to be the first women crossing Antarctica, uh, making the biggest interactive education program on the internet, remain friends on the other side, and have fun. <laughs> um, that's important. We started from Queen Maud um, in November, some of you might know the mountain ahead of us, Ulvokamma, uh, the wolf tooth. It looks like it's a day trek over there, but with the air, it's so, it's so clear, so it took us two days to, to reach that summit. But it was a fantastic area to start, to start in. 
Then we came up to the mountain plateau, we were sailing, because our route was about 3,000 kilometers, and uh, summer in Antarctica is about 100 days, so we had, we had needed help from other nature. But one day we woke up and uh, there was absolutely no wind. And what do you do when things do not go as planned? Probably like I'm here, we get up, and get up, get dressed, have breakfast and go to work, sort of. Uh, but it was not really hard for us because we had chosen a route that would bring us into the South Pole with the wind. Um, and you could see, probably hear the friction. Um, Amundsen, Nicole Amundsen, said that skiing to the South Pole was like skiing on blue because the snow crystal is that sharp and it's absolutely not light. It's more like walking. The landscape, well, Antarctica seems so much bigger and wider than its snow wind. Everything is totally quiet. And I remember laying in my tent, trying to, if I could hear something, and then I, I think I could hear the blood running my waist. Then it was really, really silent. And we had got some messages from our team in Minneapolis. Three million kids in 116 different countries had registered on the, on the on that, and this is 10 years ago. So we finally, we were, we were, we were happy, but we were not happy at, at that moment because we uh, figured out that we were far behind schedule and we felt it was irresponsible if we uh, risked a rescue operation on the mountain plateau when we are, uh, if we were too late. So we put a deadline and they said if we reached the sofa later than January 17th, we would abandon the crossing. And we had also asked the kids, the youngest kids, to create wind dances and wind songs so they could re bring the wind back to Antarctica for us. Yeah, ten days later, right to the pole. Here's the wind song. <laughs> 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 Just following one of our objectives to have fun. You know, things are difficult, but it helps with a good laugh. <laughs> We reached the South Pole just after midnight, January 16th. And that's a geographical South Pole. So we continued the crossing, and uh, here we are on the way down. The scientists at the South Pole told us that that was the warmest summer they had ever measured. This is 2000. And they also told us that we might experience water on the way down on the other side. That did not sink in and, until we were actually on the Shackleton Glacier. There was no snow left. And uh, that's pretty hard or difficult to ski down blue ice when the sled behind us just want to go into all the crevasses. The communication company told us the numbers that we had reached, uh, we got 2.1 billion media hits, thanks to calling CNN and all this other media. And then I uh, decided that we had to continue using adventure as a tool to, to promote uh, curriculums. And we had two attempts to the North Pole, and as you can see, it's totally, there's a frozen ocean, and the ice uh, in the north is getting thinner and thinner, and if you if the storm, the ice will look like this. Not not easy to pass. Comparing to skiing to the South Pole, that's very meditative. The North Pole is just like something like playing chess. You have to be concentrated 34 hours a day because it's a polar bear, the ice breaks off. So to reach out to more young people, we decided to bring one woman from each continent.